Raleigh, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. My name is Raleigh Williams. I am an investor now. I started as a lawyer doing mergers and acquisitions. I quit that to build trampoline parks, of all things, and was a small business owner for seven years. And I ultimately sold those and became an investor in people who have businesses that are looking to sell. And so today we're going to talk about selling a business, maybe pursuing a new opportunity that may be different than the one that you spent a lot of time and investment in developing. You left for a trampoline business. Nine months after I started at a big, massive law firm, I said, you know what, actually, I want to burn this whole thing down. I don't want to do any of this stuff. I would rather do anything else. Law is probably very similar to pharmacy in the sense that it it's very lockstep and it's very easy to see what your life is going to look like in 10 years because you can see someone who's a 10th year associate and someone who's a partner. And I saw their lives, which I viewed as what my life would be 10 years in the future. And I said, I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. That was the first time that I'd ever gotten a panic attack where I just had so much anxiety at the prospect of going back into work the next day. Raleigh, your opening comments here are very interesting because in pharmacy, a lot of pharmacists go into pharmacy school, some of them without ever touching foot into a pharmacy or talking to pharmacists. I think more than ever, there's people that have blinders on going in the profession. I think the average pharmacist and the average lawyer might be getting some of those same feelings in their first few years of what did I do? Yeah, I think there's a huge disconnect in what at least law and I assume pharmacy is very similar. It, it tends to attract people that have that have done very well and have been successful in school and they're very good at taking tests and they're very good at doing homework and doing what they're told and following directions and meeting expectations. I, I wanted to just start back at zero <laughs> and say, I will go back to zero right now. I had a two-year-old daughter at the time. I was our first kid, my wife. And I thought it will be so easy for me to fall prey to the golden handcuffs if I don't get out of this as quickly as I possibly can. Fast forward. So I've always been, for better or worse, I've always been okay with changing my answer, right? If at 18, I was a lawyer at 26. I said, I don't know what the, like, I'm willing to do escape rooms, trampoline parks, whatever. And then I did the same thing at 33 and I'll probably do the same thing at 40 and 52. And we'll see how many times I change that answer. Raleigh, when you're into the trampoline park or beyond, you're saying to yourself, damn, I'm glad I'm an attorney because something like this might have put someone else into the hole or they might have been blindsided by other scoundrels that are trying to do something against sure. them. Is that true? At some point, did you say, even though I'm not that, it's a pretty good combination still? Totally. I, as When I quit practicing law nine months in, there was a time where I was pretty embittered at the idea that I'd spent so much time going to law school and focusing on this thing that felt like like a career cul-de-sac that didn't really lead anywhere. It just left me in a circle that I didn't know what to do with. And over time, I've been, I found more and more gratitude for that. What was your worst emotion? I didn't like the work. I didn't like the people. I felt anxiety and I just really felt trapped. I felt, I felt like I was, like I had been, I felt like it was just such a different experience than what I thought that I was signing up yeah. for depressed about it and duped? It's very bureaucratic. Like I, I wrote an article on LinkedIn a couple years ago. I felt like I was going into a library on a daily basis and I was getting paid to take a book off of the shelf and basically transcribe the book. I'm going to take this dictionary and word by word, I'm going to rewrite it in handwriting. And if I get through two books tomorrow, then that's great. Then tomorrow, then the next day, they're going to give me three books to do. And the game never ends. The library continues to expand and you're getting paid more money than most people get paid to do something that you're not putting life or limb at risk. But it's just tedious <laughs> that I just felt like it was, it was really the first time, it was really the first time that I was in a, 
in something that there was no obvious end to. In law school or pharmacy school, you can take a class and you'll be like, wow, this is really boring, but whatever, I have a semester and I can knuckle it out and like I'll figure it out. There's no finality. There's no summer. There's no refreshing the teacher. It's like, all right, Raleigh, see 40 years from now. Now do it. It was kind of like that gnawing terror of I have to do this for the rest of my life. Seriously, this is what I signed up for. And so I don't know whether that's depression, anxiety. I don't know clinically what that maps to, but it was just something that was, I just felt so massively stuck. And it felt like the mental image that I had a lot at the time was if you're ever walking your dog, I used to have an English bulldog and you walk them for some period of time and then they just lay flat on the pavement and yeah. and you pull them with the leash and the collar yeah. like pushes <laughs> yeah. up on the wrinkles and it looks like they're about to get decapitated. So I knew that in order to get out of practicing law, I was going to have to go through that experience of having that collar slip over my face and it was going to be an unpleasant thing. I think a pharmacist listening to this, I think you set it up well, where a lot of the pharmacists have a lot of commitment. They've taken pride in being studious and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, they have the golden handcuffs. Even as employees, they're at higher figures. And sure. it's cool talking to you because when you have something pressing on you, you think you're alone. No one else understands it. But it's really every profession that's doing it. All right, Raleigh, so here's what I'm thinking. I thought that if I left the pharmacy and sold the pharmacy, and I'm an old fart now, so I don't think I'll do this, but if I did, I would find a business that I think is a little crappy looking, a little rough around the edges and a little bit old looking. You go in there, they don't say thank you. You can see there's room for improvement. I would drive to the owner's house, secretly, of course, they wouldn't see me. I would drive around their house and maybe even Google Earth, I can do this now, but I would look and see that they're doing okay. They consistently mm -hmm. have the cars in the driveway. They're in a halfway decent neighborhood and things like that. And then I would say, all right, I could make it if that's all I did. And mm -hmm. then I'm going to do better. So I'm going to get more than that. So it's the old story of basically flipping a house. You see the potential. You've done some of that, but some of it's more integrated with online stuff. What route would tickle you the most? Merging into a business, buying something that's going, or starting your own thing? I felt like when I went from practicing law to running my own business, I thought that was going to be the ticket that gave me f the freedom that I sought. That being an entrepreneur was much more there, there's much more freedom in an entrepreneurial life than a W-2 based life. If you've traversed that path before, what you realize <laughs> is that it's true in some respects and it's also not true in other respects. As a W-2 employee, you, know, you can give two weeks notice and be done with the whole thing in a matter of two weeks. It's easy to end those things. You have the things that you're worried about and it's stressful, but as the entrepreneur, you have the whole host of things. You have everything that ultimately falls to you and you have a lot of personal risk at stake. So what I've found is that sometimes going from W-2 to an entrepreneur, you find that you go somewhat from into the frying pan into the fire. And the last step that I found for myself in order to find the real freedom that I was seeking all along was building my business to be an asset that could run without me. I decided to sell it. Some decided to keep it. And once I was able to sell that first business, that was the first time in my adult life that I had the space to really reassess what do I like and what do I not like. I think, and it falls into two camps. You explained it. I think that there are people that tend to be more creative. I ran these businesses with my brother. My brother is more creative than I am. And we were able to sell the business. And when you're selling a business, if you build it the right way, you tend to get paid anywhere from five to 10 times what it makes on an annual basis. So I viewed that as, I just got paid for my next five years of work. So let me slow down. Let me take some more time and really reassess what I really like to do. My brother took that time and he said, I love being creative. I hate operating. So he took a much more entrepreneurial, he wants to start new businesses from scratch because he enjoys having an idea that no one else has 
and taking that and doing with it whatever he wants. I just like something that's predictable and that I can understand where it's going and I can optimize it. And I don't enjoy particularly the process of starting something from scratch. So when I sold those businesses, I said, never again will I start something from scratch. <laughs> I'm skipping kind of the proof of concept phase and I'm going only to businesses that are pre-existing, similar to the path that you're alluding to of what are the businesses that are that already exist, that have an owner that maybe has left them to decay in some way that I can help or an owner that has something that's going great and really just needs some help alternatively and we can build it together and I buy into the business and do it together. I find if you're trying to optimize for just what's the path, what what's the most asymmetric risk where there's like really great upside with very limited downside, I tend to find that businesses that are pre-existing, that already have a track record, that already have a customer base, a brand, a profit and loss statement that you can look at, it's much more, it's much simpler to predict where that will go into the future than it is to patent a new idea that you've been thinking about for the last 10 years. But I talk to a lot of business owners that are in the process of getting their business sellable where they can maximize the exit value of their business. Most of those people are looking to continue to work and generate income and they want to do it with the most upside, with the most limited downside. And that tends to be acquiring assets that generate free cash flow month in and month out. And the, and they've done that in the past. A lot of companies, you think of Croc with McDonald's, he got in there. He had a lot of upside, but maybe it took care of some of that bottom risk. But like you say, maybe you're not crowned as having the best idea that's ever been out there kind of thing. But do you want that or do you want some money, enough money to live? If you look at the richest man in the world right now is a guy named Bernard Arnault, who's a French guy that yep. bought LVMH, which owns Louis Vuitton. And Gucci, right? He owns Gucci, Dior. Yep. He owns a lot of these luxury brands and none of them has he started. He was a real estate developer in Miami. Right. Obviously, Warren Buffett would be another acquirer of businesses. And I think if I had a pharmacist background where I was running my own pharmacy store, I think you tend to... When you're around a lot of similar people, you tend to not see the genius and kind of the skills that you've developed along the way. And so if your crowd is pharmacists or general practitioner doctors and you're like birds of a feather flock together type of thing, you tend to not even see how far you've developed and the skill set that you do have because you're just not put in a situation where there's people that are deficient in the areas that you tend to be highly proficient in. And so I ran an escape room business and a trampoline park business, but I can work my way around a lease and a landlord negotiation and managing employees, what time they show up, what time they open, whether it's delivering a trampoline park birthday party or it's whatever a brick and mortar aspect of a different business is. The product may be slightly different, but it's a very similar process of local marketing, getting people to the foot traffic and standing out relative to competitors. It's a highly applicable playbook. And if you're someone that has taken a risk, put pen to paper, signed your name on a document that puts your ass on the line somewhere, then you're already in the top echelon of humans out there that will never take a risk, that will always sit on the sideline. And I've found that the actual competition on the real playing field, not what the people stay, say on the stands that never actually do anything, but the competition on the real playing field tends to not be as competitive as it looks like it is from the outside. So Raleigh, you then have success selling your escape room business, gives you a little bit more time to think about things and more money to do things. Do eventually you get known to be the guy that does this, does that word start to spread and people start offering you things or coming to you for questions and things like that? Yeah. The deal that I did with Jamie Wilkie in the pharmacy space, that was her reaching out to me about a question about how to potentially sell her business. And I saw it and I decided that it was a business that I'd like to be involved with. And so my process was even after I sold the escape room business and the trampoline park business, I went through, again, my own internal process of what does it look like if I'm no longer the entrepreneur that I've labeled myself as for the past seven or eight years? What does it look like if I'm an investor instead of an entrepreneur? Or 
an author. I'm in the process of writing a book right now. So for me, at every stage, from lawyer to entrepreneur to whatever this next thing is that I'm in the process of figuring out, it's been a process of shedding the last label and being okay of what does Raleigh look like if he's not an entrepreneur, if I'm not if I'm not starting a business and I'm not actively selling something and I'm not running a business with customers, what does that look like for me? And part of that process was in in the midst of selling my last company, my wife, who I've been married to for almost 12 years now, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so we had a year of her going through, she had stage three breast cancer, so chemotherapy, mastectomy, raising three children, just the reality of life and things happening and the time and the energy and the effort that's required to be an entrepreneur and kind of birth an idea from scratch and take it out to market and talk about it all day. I was just at a different stage in my life where I felt like doing that felt a little bit more hollow than it had in the past of just like running a product and hoping somebody buys more coconut water from me. Like there's there is a different layer of depth of what I just experienced in my personal life that I felt like I wanted to help entrepreneurs who are already in the midst of things, trying to figure out how to get to that last stage of making their company a sellable asset, selling it, and giving the entrepreneurs back the time to do whatever they want to do. All right, Raleigh, let's think to our listeners now. We're just going to pick a demographic. Let's say Mm -hmm. we've got a 45-year-old pharmacist and we established that a pharmacist thought pattern might be similar to what yours was. And let's say that they're starting at zero. They might have a decent chain job. They're not coming out with any debt, but obviously they're going to lose that job then if they go cold turkey. Or let's say you've got a pharmacy owner who's also, let's say, zero. They might have some debt, but maybe at least selling it off, they might get back to zero. You're 45 years old. What are we looking at? What route would you go if you're in that position? The route that I went, I I think that there's basically two paths that you can go down. We'll spread them out. So I think the first path is you may be starting at zero from a dollar amount, which is fine. And I think that tends to be the thing that people focus on the most and really becomes their barrier that they can't ever get past. But I think that there are two separate areas that you can supplement or that you have assets in that you've developed that aren't necessarily cash. The first place that I would look is I would think of it as what are the assets that you've developed over your career in terms of your network, the people that you know, the people that you have a relationship with, and who are the people that you have a great relationship with that you can start having conversations with uh, around what their business interests are, how they make money. I think uh, another barrier that people tend to run into here is a total fear of talking about money, wanting to make money, wanting to do something, particularly people with a more medical bent, like a pharmacy bent. It's like a Superman complex where like they, they don't want anyone to know that they have individual personal desires for themselves to get wealthy. And they want it to all be couched in this idea of it's better for palliative care, clinical care. Like they, they want somebody else to do well and they want that to be the focus. I think probably before you even get to what are the assets that you have from a network and what are the assets you have from a skill standpoint. I think we're doing the work for yourself of it's okay to want to be rich. It's okay to like specifically seek getting wealthy. And if you're of a more religious inclination, it's ask and ye shall receive. Like you have to be willing to ask for it. You have to be willing to seek it out specifically and not be so gun shy at the idea of wanting to make a lot of money for yourself. That tends to be the first thing that people get stuck with is like money's the root of all evil. People are going to think that I'm greedy, that I'm Scrooge McDuck. If I'm trying to make money, there's this very like unhealthy to, I would say unhealthy or at least unproductive relationship with money and trying to get money. That I think is step one, no matter what. When I was 26, I wanted to make 10 million bucks. I didn't know what I would spend it on. (laughs) Right. And my only regret at that time is that I didn't 
shoot higher because I actually, when I sold the escape room business for 26 million, my cut, debt, investors, all that things, it, it like almost hit right on the nose of what I was shooting for. <laughs> and so I look back and I said, shoot, what if I had yeah. said a hundred million dollars higher, instead of exactly, million dollars? Yeah. And so I think that's step one, irrespective is it's okay to want a lot of money for yourself. And it doesn't have to be because you're going to donate it to charity and you're going to be Mother Teresa for it. You can just do it for yourself. You can want a jet. You can want a yacht. And if you demonize people that have those things, it becomes very difficult for you to get them because the cost of getting them, the risk that you have to traverse, the dragons you have to slay, all of those things are a risk. And so you have to be okay. You have to really want the reward. And you have to set yourself up to, to want the reward. And you have to want it for yourself, not for somebody else. If I'm giving you my time and my risk, it's like, you can do it too. People will come in the store and they're like, you don't have this. It's like, no, but I have an idea. You should start a business on that across the street. I'll come to you for that when I'm looking for it kind of thing. Everybody's free to do that. One of the things I truly believe that the ambition that you have is something that is God-given and something that should be nurtured and not suppressed. And so I have always been very ambitious. From the time that I was in law school, they'd say, what kind of law do you practice? I'm like, I don't know. I just want to be rich. And that's like kind of a faux pas to say, you know, it needs to be constitutional law or helping the oppressed or going and building homes in Africa. And I think all of that's great. But it's very difficult. I've, I don't think I've ever seen someone achieve something greater than their ambition. And the ambition tends to be the anchor that kind of holds people back. And so you can work on your ambition. You can work on your relationship with money. It costs you no money whatsoever. I would buy some books on it. I would buy The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. You can buy them for 12 bucks and work on your relationship and foster your desire for economic gain. I wish more people would be honest about why they're doing things. You tend to look very mercenary when you say it. It's so much easier to say, follow your passions and do what you enjoy and you'll never work a day in your life. And just to put a fine point on it, I had zero passion or inclination or desire about trampoline parks or escape rooms or any of it. I didn't care. I wasn't like a an avid attender of any of those things. I just wanted to not practice law and I wanted to get rich doing it. And that was it. So step one is work on your relationship with money and heighten and magnify the ambition that you have for yourself. I know for me, as I got more serious about kind of thinking about what I really wanted to do and the ambitions, it became clear to me that the vehicle that I had picked of practicing law, which is very lockstep, 180, then 205, then 225, that I had more ambition than that vehicle of practicing law could ever give me and I wanted more autonomy than practicing law could ever give me. The next step was the thing that I'd started into before I backtracked into your relationship with money, which is the assets that you have within your network and your community, the people that you already know, which again, costs no money. But I, when I was practicing law, I found a buddy that was working at KPMG, which is a big accounting firm. And he also wanted to quit his job. And so weekly we would talk, we would go to lunch and talk about business ideas. And, and we would just say, can we make money doing this? We talked about collecting coins, doing remote car washes. We ran the whole gamut of what the ideas look like together. And then when I brought my brother into the conversation, I basically found a market watch article that's it was called The Unbelievably Lucrative Business of Escape Rooms. And they walked through what the escape room business looked like. I sent it to my brother and my buddy that ultimately became my partner who was working at KPMG and said, is this, is there something here? Is this possible? I, I was just trying to become as sensitive as possible to what economic opportunities look like. And I was trying to look at what my network looked like in terms of people that were wanting to make more money. Those are who ultimately became my partners in the venture. So I would say, what assets do you have in your network? And then the other potential bucket is what assets do you have in terms of the skill set that you bring to the table? You can increase the skill set that you have by buying courses, you know, that don't have to be massively expensive. And you can go to more 
networking events and really try to get outside of the circle that you already have. If you feel like the networking circle is lackluster. And I was spending a lot of time with junior associates at a law firm and I talked to all of them and none of them wanted to pursue something entrepreneurial. And so I started to look outside of that. I started to look at my church and who at church is doing something that could be interesting. I started to look at networking groups, young professional organizations that weren't law organizations. It's almost funny sometimes uh, not everybody has your same urge. Like when you talk to totally. those lawyers, it's like, you mean you don't have those urges? You mean you're going to be a lawyer? And they're like, yeah. That helped me learn that that my ambition was particular to me and different than the people that had picked the same career path as me. And I think I got into practicing law thinking if I go to a good enough school and if I work at a good enough law firm, I'm just going to be around really bright people. And of course, they're going to have divergent interests. Of course, not all of them are going to want to practice law. And what I found, the reality was that most of them went to law school because they wanted to practice law and they were practicing law because they wanted to practice law. <laughs> and so it helped reconfirm like, oh, I'm in the wrong I'm in the wrong spot. And that kind of further catalyzed the idea of I I don't belong here, which I'm not a victim to, but I got to move on and I got to find a place where I do belong, even if I have to build it myself. All right. So let's say you've hit your network and you're like, all right, people are interested. They've got maybe some dreams and things like that. Where locally would you get some of these connections. Let's say someone's going to set up shop, whatever shop it is, five miles from them. What would you do locally? If you're putting on the acquirer's hat of something that you want, something that you want to go acquire, I definitely wouldn't have any reservations about reaching out to business owners about potentially acquiring their business because the businesses will trade hands for sure. For me personally, I reach out to them on LinkedIn and say, Whenever you decide that it's time for you to sell, I would love to have a conversation if it makes sense for me to buy. And it's totally low pressure. As someone who's owned businesses and who has received that message, it's never threatening to me. It's, hey, it's flattering I want to give sometimes. you money one day. Yeah. <laughs> when I was operating businesses, there would be plenty of days where I was like, I would never sell this thing for a hundred million dollars if someone offered it to me today. And then the next day it's if someone came with a hundred grand on my doorstep right now, I would sell because I'm so done with this thing. Like the massive variance that an entrepreneur goes through in terms of what they'll, they're willing to sell their business for is day by day dependent. And I suppose if you went cold turkey from a business as a pharmacist, that might be another reason to get a going business. You've already got some cash flow coming in and that kind of thing. Yeah. And what you'll find in the business acquiring route is there are plenty of business owners. I've done this before. There are plenty of business owners that will do seller financing where you put some money down, you put 50 grand. If it's a million dollar transaction, you may put 50 or $25,000 down that you could get from an investor and the seller can be willing to do those deals because, and there's a whole host of reasons, getting out of a lease that they don't want to be a part of anymore, not dealing with the employee headaches that they've had to deal with for so long. They have kids that don't want to take over the business like they thought, a sick wife, a sick husband. There's a whole host of reasons of why someone would, why a business owner would give seller financing to a upstart entrepreneur who's going to put new energy and new life into the business that they built from scratch. I wouldn't get anything local. I don't want to do any work. I just want to sit on my ass and my fingers do the walking and talk to people like you, Raleigh, and things like that. So if I'm looking for a business, I would be online. Well, then that opens up the world. Yeah. And there's plenty of ways to start the conversations with people that are online. Like that That was when, after I got out of all of these brick and mortar businesses, I said, I'm never signing a lease again. I'm never signing a personal guarantee again. I've actually invested in some brick and mortar businesses since then, but it's done in a way that I'm not I'm not risking the kingdom for a pot of gold and I'm not putting my own ass on the line if things go poorly. I make sure that someone's there that is massively incentivized to build their fortune out of the success of the business that we're partnering on. And so that that's what kind of led me to more online style things. 
and it's an iterative process as you take the risk that you're that you can tolerate and then you let it play out and you say that I want to course correct and I want to go only online or I want to do more pharmacy stuff and I think you figure it out over time as you take those initial steps and take action. So Raleigh, what are your personal goals? Not dollar numbers, but what would be your dream of, and I know it could switch, is there a certain number of businesses, a certain involvement you want to be? What would that look like for you? The place that I enjoy now more than I ever have is I really enjoy being a part of an entrepreneur's journey, taking them from where the business sits today to a sale and to to exit the business. My own personal experience, again, was going, like I say, it's like frying pan to fire to freedom. And I enjoy helping the entrepreneur go from their first stage of the business that they thought was going to free them from stress, selling it to give them the time and the freedom to do whatever they want to do for the rest of their life. And it tends to look very different than the thing that they were doing previously. I, I don't have a number in terms of the amount of businesses that I want to own or be a part of. I think I've, as I've done it more and more, I've, I want to own the fewest amount necessary, not the most necessary. <laughs> Satisficer versus a maximizer. What's sufficient? It's the part of the entrepreneurial journey that I felt most stuck in was I was running a business. Again, it felt very similar to when I was practicing law and I felt stuck, but I had I was the creator of my own cage, right? I had built this business that couldn't exist without me and and was very difficult to figure out how to sell. And and that's the part that I enjoy the most. Like when I bought into Jamie's business was I will buy into this under the premise that we're going to get this thing to look like an asset and we'll sell it a second time. So I'm going to buy in. This is your first exit. And then we're going to work together on the second exit. And, and I enjoy that process. I, en- I enjoy helping the entrepreneur. I enjoy helping the entrepreneur get there. I enjoy doing that side by side with the entrepreneur, right? Like I, I've looked at plenty of businesses where the entrepreneur is trying to sell and they want to get out and go to Mexico or do whatever they want to do for the rest of their life. And my deal is usually I'm willing to get in this boat as long as you're staying in the boat with me and we're going to get into this thing and we're going to, we're going to do it together. There have been difficulties that I didn't anticipate, and there's been a lot of great things that have happened that I didn't anticipate either. And so that's the thing that I've enjoyed doing and writing about and talking about more and more is there's so much conversation about passion-driven entrepreneurship of do what you love. Selling a business is almost this dirty secret of like, I don't want anybody to know that I want to move on and do something different. My dad, who is a lawyer, he always said, a business has no soul to save and no ass to kick. Like the business itself is not anything that you need that requires passion to do. And you can find and fill that passion elsewhere. And there are things that are a lot more important than making more money month over month. And they tend to be human related, dealing with your children, your spouse, your parents, the people that are in your orbit. And a lot of times I think as entrepreneurs, we tend to minimize those things because the exigencies of the business are always pressing on us. I'm doing this for you guys. I enjoy helping entrepreneurs get out of the last prison that they've created for themselves. So you were honest about saying that money is a goal. What other goal, though, are you looking for? What other need do you have in this business? Who are you trying to impress? So you make money, but where's that maybe 10-year-old or 15-year-old or 25-year-old that's inside of you that, that you're saying, look, world, I did this? Is that there? What are you trying to prove? Yeah, I think the thing that I always say to people is you need to make enough money to know that it's not the answer. And then go find what is. That was my process. I always attributed money to freedom, money to do whatever I wanted to do, to not be told what to do from my parents and not just to have total autonomy in how I chose to live my life. And then after I got enough money to do that, I found that I still wanted more. You're always one zero away from being happy enough with money. Yeah. <laughs> you just need one more zero at the end of your bank account and, th- and then you're happy. And as I sold those businesses, 
I started to spend more time thinking about not what can I make the most money in, but where can I uniquely contribute in a way that's unique to me and my experiences? Who are the people's lives that I would be interested in changing for the better? And how can I contribute to those? And usually it tends to look like some version of you five or 10 years prior, some of the harder problems that you've had to overcome yourself. What I've ultimately found is that like any external answer of who are you trying to impress or what are you trying to do or what does the car mean or the house mean or the whatever mean, once you have enough stillness in your life, you can find that it's you yourself, that you're, it's a conversation with yourself, that self-confidence, self-belief, and you can never control whether your parents love you or your kids love you, or even if your spouse loves you, but if you love you and you love what you're doing and you feel like you're uniquely contributing in a way that maximizes your gifts that you've been given, then I think that's contentment, fulfillment. If you'd asked me that five years ago, I would have been too much in the hustle and bustle to have a more thoughtful answer. Yeah, mine and the pharmacy, that is no longer an image thing for me. I think it's always been cool to say that I'm an owner. I know the podcast, the reason for this, Raleigh, is I'm the eighth of 12 children. Yeah. And when you're the eighth of 12 children, you don't get a word in. If you want to be heard, you have to have a podcast. You're not going to be heard by your older brothers. You're the little punk brother. For me, that was law school. I'm not going to be heard from my parents and my older siblings unless I'm sophisticated, unless I'm very well educated and I can out argue them and what the right answer is. And at least for me, my process has been, okay, well, what about you listening to yourself? (laughs) And that's been... My lawyer answer, like of what I wanted to do growing up, saying a lawyer was an answer that everyone was happy with, except for me once I got into it. And same with entrepreneur. And so it's been that that process of just like making myself proud of what I'm doing. And if anyone else has a problem with it, that's okay too. So Raleigh, pharmacists are listening to this and they're falling up in their driveway and so on. They've got a few minutes to maybe think about this conversation And let's just pretend there may be the situations that you were in earlier on. What advice would you give to them? I think the advice that I got that was the most helpful in that stage was, I think we're all on our own hero's journey, where we're the hero of our own life and You can't avoid that journey by not taking any risk (laughs) or you can. And the payment for that, the recompense for that will be massive regret and wishing that you had done something differently. And the, the fear of pain, the fear of the pain that you think that a less well-trodden path will bring, the fear of the pain is always worse than the pain itself. And the anticipation, the anxiety that it produces you're experiencing something worse than if you were to just do it. Because once you just do it, everything that you feel, it pales in comparison to the anxiety that you generate thinking about what it will be like. And I think taking a proactive step that doesn't have to be a massive step, it could be telling your significant other, hey, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually pretty unhappy in my job and I want to do something different. I, I want to try something different. I don't know what it means yet. I don't have the answer, but I'm just really unhappy and I would love for your support and what it looks like doing something different. That can be a massive step. That can be a conversation that you've never had before with anybody else. And I think taking those steps and like expanding the amount of risk and bringing more people into the conversation because a lot of times it just stays in our head and we're playing out everything in our head and no one else knows. And so just doing something that puts you back in the hero seat of taking an affirmative action towards the thing that you want. Raleigh, boy, thanks for joining us today. It's so important in every profession to know there's an option out there. You might not use the option. You might not care about the option, but it's important to not think that what you're doing in life is the only way it can go. And so thanks for opening that up for us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. And hopefully we convince some people to take some more autonomy and control of whatever they want to do. Absolutely. All right, Raleigh, we'll keep in touch. And thanks again. 
Thanks, man.